Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today I'll be continuing to read Becoming Muhammad Ali. So let's continue. Round 4 We were all just kids, doing the dumb stuff kids do. But Cassius was always different. With those big eyes on some picture show that the rest of us couldn't quite see, we all dreamed about the future. But I think Cassius really, truly saw it. Like a movie, starring him. And he always did things his way. I remember b mornings when the bus, when the bus would stop to pick us up from school. Everybody got on except Cassius. He'd hang back and let the bus get a little head start, and then he'd race it all the way to school, twenty blocks down Chestnut Street, with the rest of us kids hanging out the window and cheering him on, especially the girls. Crazy, crazy Cassius, they said. He's, an, he's as nutty as he can be. This, those same girls were the ones who winked and waved at him when they saw him shadow boxing after school, throwing punches at himself against a brick wall. Whatever he did, he seemed to attract attention, like a star. But there were times he was silent and thoughtful, too. Some nights, me and Cassius and Rudy would just lie on the grass out in the back of their house, Looking up at the sky, Cassius would say he was waiting for an angel to appear. Rudy always had his mama's Kodak brownie camera handy. He didn't want to miss a chance to getting the world's very first angel snapshot. I was never sure what Cassius wanted from that angel. Maybe he wanted the angel to tell him that he was really the greatest or give him some kind of heavenly blessing. Maybe he was looking for a sign that there was a higher power watching over him. Anyway, it never happened. We never saw a single angel on Grand Avenue. But before too long, Cassius found some inspiration right down the road at the racetrack. Back then, we all lived pretty close to Churchill Downs, where they hold the Kentucky Derby every year. It was one of the classiest and fanciest places in all of Louisville. Still is. It's where the best and fastest horses in the world train. Cassius loved those horses. The way they looked, the way they moved, the proud and noble way they held their heads. But he wasn't content to just watch them. He wanted to race them. So he would go out on the track in the morning while the dew was still on the grass. When the trainers brought out the horses for their exercises, Cassius would ride alongside them. They're the only thing faster than me, he'd say. One time, he actually got in front of a horse on the track. When the horse swerved to get out of his way, the, uh, the rider fell off and landed hard on the dirt. Bam! That was the end of Cassius's horse racing career. After that little incident, he got kicked off the track for good. But he still hung around the stables. He couldn't give enough of those thoroughbreds. Most of all, he loved the shape of their smooth, powerful muscle, and he wanted to have it get his own body in condition, condition like that, stronger and faster than anybody in the world. This is the part where Cassius is talking. So let's continue. During the summers, we went to Camp Sky High, played paddle ball with wooden rackets, and pulled pranks on unsuspected counselor, unsuspecting counselors. We shot hoops with a tennis ball and tried not to get pushed in the pond. When we got home, we played roller skate hockey on 34th Street, but that got boring, so Rudy and I made scooters out of our skates. On Friday nights, we had fish fries, and on Saturdays, everybody on the block went to Riney's, sat on his lawn, and watched boxing fights on an old TV that his grandmama set outside on her front step stoop. Tomorrow's champion. At seven o'clock each Saturday night, fathers, sons, and a few daughters sat in awe for three televised fights, spellbound by the rhythm, by the hustle, by the might of two stroopy boys throwing wild blows till one went down or the bell rang at the end of the third round and the judges decided who was tomorrow's champion. 50 cents. 
Bird didn't like me and Rudy betting on account of God not liking ugly. And all gambling is is ugly, GG. But I like taking Ronnie's money. So when it was time for Saturday night main event, I bet him that swift-footed, gorgeous George was going to knock down Billy Goode. Which he did. I Then I collected my winnings, gave Rudy a quarter, and spent the rest of the night dreaming of being in the ring one day and trying not to make my eyes at this short cutie named Tina Clark, a.k.a. Teeny, who all my friends said was in love with me. On the way home, I would skip and duck like I saw the boxers do on TV, tell Rudy to hold his hands up so I could punch them like I saw the boxers do on TV, make up songs that rhymed in my head and dance between the cracks on the sidewalk like I was in the ring. Like I was Gorgeous George, like I was a big time boxer on TV. Odd jobs. Everybody had a job. We all wanted bikes, shiny new ones. So we saved our money from birthdays and Christmas and odd jobs. Most of the fellows would skate around White Parkland delivering roses, tulips, and other colorful flowers to Ms. Kinslow's flower shop. Riney used to cut grass, 50 cents for the front, 75 for the back, because the back was always larger. Me and Rudy delivered Ebonoi magazine every month, but my regular pay came from baby- babysitting the Montgomery kids, which was the easiest, because all we did was listen to boxing message on their matches on their big tube radio. Cobb got his bike first, two in fact, one for his cousin. Because she was shining one of his customers' mahogany shoes at the horse track down at the fairgrounds for 40 cents. And the guy refused to pay him, tossed him a race ticket instead for a long-shot horse named Get Out of My Way that ended up winning, paying Cobb a whooping 560 spanking dollars. Ronnie never got a bike because his lawnmower skills were as bad as his grandmother's haircutting skills. I made enough money for a bike, but as it turned out, I never had to spend it on one. And here's why. The block. Riney and Lucky were shooting marbles on the curb. Jake and Newboy were singing under the boardwalk on the front porch. Rudy was across the street talking to a girl from the sidewalk, because her daddy didn't let no boys in their yard. I was shadow boxing next to the redbud tree in our yard, and Short Bubba was telling everybody that Cobb said that Big Head Paul told him that Chalky pull- that he saw Chalky pulling a boxcar with his teeth. The legend of Corky Butler. Chalky was the biggest, strongest, meanest kid in Louisville. He lived on the other side of the railroad tracks in Smoketown. He had fists the size of grapefruits, and he used them to pummel anybody who stepped into the ring with him and to, and to terrorize everybody in the neighborhood. He didn't ride a motorcycle, but he always had a biker's jacket. He was 16 or 26. Nobody really knew. But he looked like a man and was built like a truck which he would lift to impress the girls. He wasn't bullying or knocking out dudes in the ring or on the street. We used to see him hanging out at Dreamland, where all the gangsters hung. So if Short Bubba said Cobb said Big Head Paul said Chalky pulled a box tar with, with his teeth, he probably did. The story continues. So, while Short Bubba is telling us the story, Teeny and some of her friends walked by stopping in front of the Montgomery's house next door, posing and posturing in matching light yellow skirts, dancing and singing, stealing glimpses at me, and pretending they weren't impress- impressed with me stabbing the air like my fists were knives. And all the fellas followed behind them like puppy dogs, but not me. I stayed back, throwing jabs at the wind, till my father drives up in his rusty black pickup and rolls down the window. Conversation with my daddy. Hop in here, Gigi, he says. Yes, sir. Hey, Rudy, I scream. Come on. Just me and you, Cassius. Rudy can stay here. Where are we going? I ask, climbing in the front seat. We're going where we're going. That's where we're going. Daddy, can I ask you something? 
Boy, I don't know, can you? It's just, speak your mind, boy. For Christmas, can I, uh, get a pair of boxing gloves? Daddy? You want to be successful, Cassius? Yes, sir. Education is the bicycle that can get you there, Cassius. You keep pedaling, sometimes uphill, sometimes down. Huh? I want to see you doing better in your schooling, not throwing punches at the wind. Just having fun, Daddy. Because for everyone you see in that ring, a hundred been knocked out of life. You gotta work on them grades. I know. Your great-granddaddy was a slave. Your granddaddy was in jail. I ain't finished high school. You got the chance to be the first clay that to really do something. Not if you include the white Cassius Clay that I was named after. Oh, he was a lawyer and a soldier. Granddaddy Herman told me he was a hero who freed all the slaves. He didn't free all of them. What does that tell you? Maybe he wasn't a hero. GG, I want you to be the first of us to go to college. Do something with yourself. School's not for me, Daddy. I'm going to be a star. Just don't know how I'm going to shine yet. Education is the only way I know how to find your shine, son. You found yours. I, could, uh, I would always draw since before I could walk. When I got to paint in grade school, everything changed. The teacher showed me the Sistine Chapel in a book, and I decided that was the kind of art for me. So, you were always going to be an artist? Until I ran up on Jim Crow, who said Negroes can't be artists. So, the, so I did the next best thing, and did signs for pawnbrokers and preachers. All the clays got natural talents. Your granddaddy, rest in peace could have played big leagues, but they didn't allow no black players. I know. The world is white, Cassius, he said, pulling up to a church. The world is snow white. What are we doing here? Me going to Bible study or something? Just come on. Something I want to show you. We walk into Clifton Street Baptist Church and sit in the third row of the pews like Sunday service is about to start. Only it's Tuesday and church is empty, except for me, him, and a whole bunch of flying ladies wrapped in white sheets and green wings holding flowers painted on the ceiling. What you think of my latest masterpiece, Gigi? This is your Sistine Chapel, Daddy? Well, I ain't no Michelangelo, but it's decent work. It's the same picture from the Bible, right? Similar, I added my own style to it. It's real good, Daddy, but I got one question. Say it then. Where were all the black angels when they took the picture? When we pull up in front of our pink house, all the neighborhood kids are still outside joking and jump roping and playing tug-of-war with the setting sun. I climb out of the blue-black truck ready to finish sparring till nightfall when Daddy slams his door and hollers, Get that tree and my painting stuff out the back, Gigi. Early Christmas. Lying under the tarp that covers our Christmas tree, his vinyl primer, his lettering brushes, his lettering animal, his cups and pencils, his erasers and rulers, his stencils, his crusty buckets, his brush cleaners, his, his chalk powder, his ocean blue glass paint, his burnt umber acrylic paint, his mineral oil, his wobbly old ladder, and my brand new fire engine red super jumbo jet speed racing Schwinn bicycle. All hail to the king. Everybody stood at attention, eyes glued on me and my superbike like I was Commander Cassius, the leader of Louisville. I let Rudy ride first, but all he did was fall and scrape my brand new chrome. So I promised to teach him later. I let Riney take it for a quick spin. Then I hopped on, rode around the block four times, and had Cobb time me, since he was the only one of us with a watch. On my last trip, Teeny strolled over, her lips shooting me the, a, a smile that big as the sky. Then she took her keys off and her purple rabbit foot keychain hooked it to the spotlight clamp on my handlebars and said, For good luck, Gigi, so you don't fall. So I let her ride on the handlebars up and down twice, up and down the block twice. Then I rode the night wind by myself, 
popping wheelies and showing off my smooth as butter fire engine royal red twin bike with its shiny spotlight crowning the front. After school started back up in the fall, Teeny didn't come around as much, and when she did, her eyes didn't light up like stars no more, which was okay with me, because between running with Rhyming, getting tortured by Miss Alberta, and cruising around town on my Schwinn, I didn't have time for much else. Mystery. One day I was flying home with Rudy on the handlebars, trying to outride the dusk and get home before the streetlights came on when I swore I saw Corky Butler running from the alley behind our house. The lights on my bike worked like the hot water around our tub. Sometimes. Today, they didn't. So, we hustled in the near dark, hoping we could sneak in the back before Daddy stumbled through the front. When, bam, we hit something, and Rudy and I went flying onto the gravel. We got up, bruised, inches from what was not something but a someone, lying stone-cold dead on the gravel. We ran inside, both of us wondering to ourselves who the body belonged to, whether it was really dead, and neither of us saying a single word to each other or anyone else about it, ever.